Shall we? <laughs> okay. Hello and welcome to this episode of Talk the Talk, RTRFM's weekly show about linguistics, the science of language. For the next hour, we're going to be bringing you language news, language typology, and some great music. Maybe we'll even hear from you. My name's Daniel Midgley. I'm here with Ben Ainsley. Good morning. And Kylie Sturgis. Good day, everyone. What's the relationship between climate and sound? A linguist has released a trio of papers showing that the sounds we use may be influenced by the air we breathe. Is there anything to it? How have other scientists reacted? And how does an idea change minds? We'll find out on this episode of Talk the Talk. So, our live recording was heaps of fun. Wasn't that amazing? Really, really good. A huge thank you again to Dali Pigram, who was just the bee's knees. Mm. And to the folks behind the Disrupted Festival at the State Library of Western Australia. There was and a lot of love in that room. I was going to say, of course, to all of the people who came and saw us. What legends? Hi. What happened there? Yeah, that was real cool. <laughs> we so like too. have fans. Who knew? Mm. Well, you know, I, I wanted to just spend a little bit more time on one of the stories that we had as part of our fact and fiction last time. You, you want to do a deep dive? A little bit. A Ooh. medium dive. And the reason is because it's, uh, it's coming up in people's feeds still. This story has a lot of traction, a lot of people really concerned. Maybe, oh, I know what we're talking about then. <laughs> Maybe it'll have you worried then. <laughs> Robot overlords. Oh. Da, 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 da. <laughs> yes, Facebook's AIs who invented supposedly their own language and then had to be killed <laughs> or something. Look, I support the crisis narrative that you're engaging in, but I suspect that you don't. So why don't you give it the slightly more linguist run of the sort of news? Kylie, what have you got for this? Well, I'm not sure if it's a Jonathan Coulton story or a Flight of the Concord story, quite frankly. Two AI agents developed inside Facebook. People thought they were originally speaking to each other in plain old English, and then they realised they made a mistake in programmers, the researchers. They weren't sticking to the English language. They were essentially creating something called a generative adversarial network. Network. Adversarial network? Adversarial, Adversarial, network. Adversarial network. Adversarial network, which sounds like a lot of fun, but it made people freak out. Uh, a little bit. It didn't make the programmers freaked out. They just said, oh, well, this program isn't doing what we want, so let's turn it off. Aww. Now, was it? Is that true? I mean... Wasn't the program doing what they wanted, but just more efficiently because it dropped, like, dumb human meat space language, which was slowing it down? See, that sounds like freaking out to me. I mean, why not let them be as, you know, as productive as they could be? There was no benefit to using actual English, so they just started using English words in a way that was a little difficult to understand. What was some of that output, Kylie? So we had two bots, one called Bob, one called Alice, for example. Bob says, I can, can, I, I, everything else. And Alice says, balls have zero to me, 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 to me to me, to me, to me, to Cool. That was what they said. <laughs> Decipherable. Now, you know, if I said to you, take one, now add one, add one, add one, add one more, add one more, you'd lose track pretty quickly. Yeah. But computers don't. Right. Mm. They have a very, very easy way to keep track of that. They just memorize everything. Yes. And they never forget, and they never get tired, and they never have attention lapses. Right. So the programmers just shut everything down, and that they didn't let the program run to eternity, and so that freaked out people. It's like, oh no, it got too powerful, it must be destroyed. No, Skynet. It was, it's Skynet. It, it was just doing stuff that it shouldn't have been doing and they just stopped it that's all it did get me thinking though and this was part of the fast company design article that, that we, we read for this it got me thinking about what a computer language would be like what kind of a language would computers invent any ideas uh i, I mean you'd have to imagine that at first it wouldn't be particularly complex like like we just saw, mm. right? If they want to count to eight instead of figuring out some sort of like shared code for eight, they might just count to one eight times. Mm. Well, I found some work that touches on this very thing. Now, we've already seen in a previous episode, episode 213, Short and Sweet, that human languages tend to minimize the distance between things that go together. Yes. So, for example, if a human language has an expression like red house, it's going to keep the red and the house together for obvious reasons. Yeah, because our working memory is pretty limited. Well, And that is the subject of a study that I found by Hannah Cornish, Rick Dale, Simon Kirby, and Morton Christiansen. See, my working memory already forgot the first name. 
<laughs> published in Plos One. The team was thinking about why there are patterns in language. Could it be that patterns in syntax can arise just out of usage because it's convenient? Well, I would have thought the exact same thing that I articulated for how a computer language would manifest would be the exact same way that our languages manifest. We develop like um, toolkits for when we encounter problems that aren't get roundable. So mm. essentially when our wetware just kind of goes mm, no. <laughs> we go, okay. So we can't we can't count to eight by going one, 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 one. Yeah, and remember also that we tend to categorize things like we see a whole bunch of different things and we put it in a bin like dog or chair. Sure. A computer wouldn't have to do that. Yes. They mm. could have literally millions of words for things, whereas we are, we have constraints on working memory. Exactly. Now, I want to give you a little memory test, both of you. <gasps> Goody! Competition time! <laughs> to see, yes. Have, I'm going to ask you to memorize. Is this going to be us versus the computers or what? Nope. Nope. Uh, yes. Okay. Yes. Yes. I'm, yes. Kylie, I'm, test. Kylie, test. I'm not I'm, looking. I'm not looking. Okay, I'm going to ask looking. you to. I'm going to ask you to memorize a string of 12 letters. Mm -hmm. I'll give you a few seconds. Go. When you're ready, just uh, go ahead. Ben? I, B, M, A, B, C, D, D, uh, T, K, G, D. G, B. But otherwise, oh. perfect. 11 out of 12. Kylie? Well done. Okay, we had A, B, C, mm -hmm. I, B, M, yep. D, D, T, yep. K, G, B. Yep. Oh, hang on. <laughs> she got the what? She got the chunked one. I got the I got the nonsense. <laughs> the, you had the exact same sequence of letters, but Kylie's yep. was chunked in a way that was recognizable mm. entities. So she only really yeah. had to memorize four things. These I, good old acronyms. Um, I was cheating because I know about chunking, so I was okay. like, I can I can I can brute force chunk these. That's fine. <laughs> well, this team gave a memory test to subjects. They had them memorize strings of fifteen letters chunked in groups of three, four, five, and so on. Mm -hmm. But there was a twist. In this experiment, you had to memorize letters and then you know, say what you remembered. And whatever it was that you remembered became the data for the next person. Ah, so you would see a uh, an almost sort of cascade failure, if you will, of memory. Well, here's the funny thing. They didn't see a cascade of failure. They saw a cascade of success. What? Ah. By the time they got to the 10th generation, people actually did a better job of remembering than they had in the earlier round. I suppose the way we could explain this is that people wouldn't remember the exact sequence of letters perfectly. So at every step in this telephone chain, they would change the strings a little bit just to make them easier easier to remember, and that means changing some letters and chunking the letters together in ways that human brains found easier. So wherever the sort of the string homogenizes to is like the most mediocre memory <laughs> string it's possible, like the perfect average of memory. Maybe. But then what the experimenters did was they looked at what came out in Generation 10. Right. To see if there was any pattern there. Oh, so yeah, what things gets dropped, mm -hmm. and I'm, um, okay. Can we do some guesses, Kylie? What do you reckon? What do you reckon stays, and what do you reckon drops? Oh. I gotta think. I gotta think. Random letters like X and Q stay, because they always stick. Because they're so freaky. Yeah, yeah. they're you such notice weird them when you're letters. Playing your Scrabble, it's like, oh no, I got a Z and a Q and a P and a <laughs> I'm, Y. I've also got to think the anything? vowels get all higgledy piggledy. They mm. get mixed up a bit. What they found was that there were these patterns of two and three letters that would just keep getting built up and they would pop up. Do you have a list of them? Sure. In the beginning, you had things like CWC and LXS okay. and WKXL. But by the time you get to the end, it had things like KXSLC, KSCLC, KXCLX. There was lots of, like, beginning with oh. K and lots of Xs nearby. You, you know what? You saying it out loud... Do you know what it is, I reckon? I think it's easy, like, it bounces in the mouth really effectively. KX. CLX. K-S-C-L-X. It works. <laughs> mm. Whereas, like, what was one of the early strings that got dropped? Uh, there was X-W-L-K-W. Yeah, that doesn't <laughs> roll off the tongue <laughs> that's, that's as awful easily. Sounding. It's yeah. got W's, but yeah, yeah. it's not euphonious. Mm. Yep. Euphonious. Mm. There's a word. That's... Can that be word of the week? <laughs> no. Okay. <laughs> but this is the interesting thing, you know? Through repeated communication, a system built up, just like it does with language. Yeah, right. And... and Going back to old uh, Hokum Ben theory, it built up because it's easy. It's a nice little workaround. Mm. And that's because we have limited memory. Yeah.
We are we are fallible creatures. Oh, yeah. Mm. So it seems that languages are the way they are, in part because of subtle pressures that we don't quite understand. What else is there besides constraints on working memory? Well, this is going to tie into our topic today because we're going to be talking to somebody who thinks he's found another force that exerts a subtle pressure, slowly sculpting language to be the way that it is, and that's the air that we breathe. Ooh, mm. massaging language via air. <laughs> well done. But now, let's take a track, shall we? Sure. This one's going to be Calm Trues with Memory on RTR FM 92.1. If you are just joining us on this week's episode of Talk the Talk, we are talking about subtle pressures exerting themselves on the development of language. Perhaps even the air that we breathe. Do you remember back in episode 124, Sound Reasoning, when we talked about the work of one Dr. Caleb Everett of the University of Miami? I remember that, and I also remember subsequently we also did a show that was kind of like, nah, probably not a thing. Mm. And then Mr. Everett was like, okay, cool. And he took that feedback from the scientific community and he doubled down. And he was like, I'm going to do more research. And I'm guessing this is what happened. And this is what happened. Awesome. He came He came back with evidence and I changed my mind. <gasps> Nicely done. Oh, how Thank skeptic you. of you. Nice work. <laughs> Was a thing. Wasn't a thing. Now, once again, maybe is a thing. Keeping the mind open in, in face of new evidence. That's how it goes. But now he's released a third paper, which may have us finding that it's no longer a thing. No, just kidding. Oh. <laughs> Don't. I can't handle it anymore. <laughs> <laughs> he has this idea that he likes to call geophonetics, that climate has an impact on the sounds that we use in language, that over a long, long time it exerts a very tiny, tiny pressure, and over thousands of years, we see languages being a certain way that they wouldn't otherwise have been. Mm. It doesn't immediately seem too ridiculous a concept, does it? To the to the sort of like the Occam's razor of like, is that really dumb? Nah, doesn't seem really dumb. It's not dumb to think that, that our environment has a conditioning effect on us. Sure. No problem. Yeah. On the other hand, linguists have heard a lot of really dumb stories that sound a lot like this. Yes. And I, I can't help but kind of feel that like the whole folk etymology rule of if it sounds too good to be true it usually is often applies to like heaps of linguistics mm. oh, are yeah. you really are you entertained or does this idea seem fun almost certainly not no, a thing it's not a thing no, <laughs> linguists sorry. being unfun for like a hundred years dolphins are just playing around they're yeah. not actually trying to tell you about what the world's like oh man <laughs> so his latest paper is called languages in drier climates use fewer Vowels. Oh, vowels. Well, when there's dry air, the larynx has to work harder to vibrate to make sound. And what's the most vibrating kind of sound that there can be? Uh, e vowels. Oh. So over oh. long periods of time, he thinks people compensate by adapting their language to use sounds that don't take quite so much vibrational effort. Consonants. Oh. Down with the vowels, up with the consonants. So I caught up with Dr. Everett, and we took it blow by blow through the three papers he he's authored on this topic. All right. So, I've read the paper. I've read some other stuff. Okay. Let's see where we left things last time. Uh, round one in this emerging field of geophonetics. Round one was altitude and ejectives. So, if you are right. on a mountain, you're very likely to have ejective sounds like and t and yeah, you have a probabilistically, you know, higher chance of if you speak a language in a higher elevation region that it that it has uh, ejectives in it. And I remember that the reaction to this was widespread skepticism. What do you remember from that time? Uh, widespread skepticism. I think that's a fair uh, fair assessment. Um, <laughs> And, uh, I, I mean, my frustration with that, I mean, some of it was, I mean, there are different things. So, right, you have a lot of people just drawing over simplistic conclusions, both positive and negative. Um, it, you know, some of this relates to the media. Some, you know, there's the, the, the conclusions of the study, I think, got a bit oversimplified. Um, at the core, what I was suggesting was that because of compression of air at higher altitudes, there might be a factor leading to greater ease of articulation uh, for ejectives. In other words, they might just be slightly easier to make at higher elevation, and maybe that's leading to this pattern. 
So that in and of it, that really isn't that controversial of a thing. I don't think the idea that ease of articulation, you know, impacts the likelihood of sounds. I was just suggesting that hey, maybe ambient air characteristics impact ease of articulation. Uh, but there is certainly skepticism towards that, and I think that's that's pretty fair because the data uh, remain correlational. I shared that skepticism, and what I was thinking at the time was, well, this just sounds like another dumb thing that I've heard before, like that the Australian accent is the way it is because people were squinting in the sun, and so they would talk a certain way, and that's why, you know, it, it sounded like a story like that. Yeah, and I think that one of the things I underestimated was that, um, you know, because there are these sort of, um, I won't even say pseudoscientific, but these sort of uh, quack hypotheses out there, um, I did not expect... Um, and uh, that that my conclusions would get sort of lumped in with that stuff. Mm -hmm. And I certainly understand it in the light of some of the media reports that were out there because it made it seem as though my study claimed that, you know, if you go up a mountain on a Sunday afternoon, you're going to come down, you know, using ejectants or something <laughs> like that when I was claiming something subtle over, you know, centuries or thousands of years, and I admitted the possibility that it might be coincidence. But... You know, that's not how. Instead, a lot of people said, oh, we've heard all this kind of crazy stuff before. This is basically what you just said. And, and that was one thing that I was sort of naive to, uh, the expectation that that might happen. Okay, but then we, you followed it up with round two with dryness and tone. That in a dry area, you're slightly less likely to see tone languages emerging. Yes, so that was with a couple of colleagues of mine um, at the Max Planck. We published this study in January 2015 in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, and that's ex essentially what we showed. Here again, though, the, the claim at the core of it is that there's ambient air characteristics impacting ease of articulation. And we did a lot of background research looking at studies in laryngology that show pretty conclusively and experimentally that really dry air does impact how the vocal cords operate. And so our hypothesis was that, okay, if it impacts the way the vocal cords operate, then it probably should have some impact on the distribution of tone. And again, the findings were correlational, but when we looked at 3,700 languages, we found uh, strong support for this idea. Okay. And was the response better? Yeah, I think the response was slightly better, right? So there's still a, there's still a fair amount of skepticism. This time, I myself was less naive to that, so I I kind of expected that going into it. Um, and there there was some skepticism, but there was it was a different response because I had more people saying, you know, I'm not totally convinced, but I am convinced that maybe we should look at this, and that we we haven't really addressed this possibility uh, carefully. Okay, yeah, that was what I said basically too. So. <laughs> I'm just like everybody. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was the take. That was the take on Talk to Talk, right? <laughs> Pretty much. Okay, but now you're following it up with the powerhouse, the round three. This is dryness and vowels. That in areas where it's slightly more arid, you will have probabilistically a slightly lower chance of having more vowels to consonants. How does this play out exactly in a language? So the the claim at its core, um, and this actually goes back to the same time that we did the tone study, the hypothesis. But this we now have. I had a database where I could test it in in a way that I felt was satisfactory. But the claim comes down again to ease of articulation. So basically, really dry air and all these laryngology studies suggest uh, really dry air leads to slightly more effort for voicing for vibrating your vocal cords together. Hmm. Um, since vowels require that you, that you vibrate your vocal cords together, um, the the sort of natural hypothesis was, okay, maybe there's this slight dispreference uh, for vowels in these areas. All right, so obviously vowels are critical to the audibility of language. We need vowels, so any, any effects would, would be minor. But the prediction was that if you look at really frequent words, and there's this database with over 7,000 language varieties represented that has a list of frequent words transcribed um, so that you can analyze phonetically what sounds are being used, my hypothesis was that if you look at the very frequent words, maybe we're going to get this, this pattern where in really dry areas they rely on vowels a little bit less. And when I looked at the data, in this case, I would say this was the strongest association of the three. Dry air seems to be doing something, but again, the findings are correlational, so um, 
you know, we have a lot more work to do to prove that. One thing that a lot of people said was, hey, you know, this is a correlational study. Correlation doesn't mean causation. Right. My response to that was always, well, okay, yeah, maybe correlation doesn't indicate causation. But if you've got somebody who has taken a look at all the other possible explanations, as it seems that you did, and has sort of controlled for them, and the correlation still holds, well, then maybe we are looking at a causative situation. Yeah, and I think that's what, that's what I'm suggesting. And in the paper, I make it clear, I, I, even in the abstract, and I know some people don't read even through to the end of abstract, sometimes they just look at the title, but I say this does not show causation. What it shows is that we need to more carefully consider the possibility of causation. Of co- you know, we've all known since, you know, early years in school, we've heard the adage that correlation isn't causation, but obviously correlations are also critical to the scientific arsenal, right? They point us, and they gesticulate in the direction of causal relationships all the time. <laughs> we can't take, they're not sufficient, but they point us there and they can say, okay, this is something that we, we, we need to look at. I mean, tobacco lobbyists love to point out that there's just a correlation between cancer rates and smoking, right? Uh, Yeah, it's just correlational, but in that case, we have some really good other evidence suggesting, okay, that correlation is, there's no way it can just be a coincidence. In here, we don't have as strong of evidence, obviously, I'm not suggesting that we do, but we do have this really strong correlation, and based on the laryngology data, which are experimental, I'm suggesting that, hey, we need to look at this stuff, because as you said, I controlled for the relatedness of languages, I controlled for um, the geographic areas in which they are spoken, you know, the things that we know impact uh, the likelihood that languages will have similar uh, phenomena. And even still, the association showed itself to be pretty robust. In fact, much more robust than the previous two associations that we had looked at in our studies. Dr. Caleb Everett from the University of Miami talking about geophonetics. Sounds like geophonetics might be a thing. Might be a thing. I know we have one listener who's really frustrated by our, (laughs) like, insane prevalence of thing, but... (laughs) It's Hello. just so handy. It might be a thing. It might be a thing. It might be a thing. I'm not convinced. I mean, this has to go through peer review and everything, and it's going to be talked over for a while. Maybe not. Maybe it won't get the attention mm. as so much scientific literature doesn't. Mm. And yet, you know, sometimes this attention is a double-edged sword. Ooh. Well, there's this academic publicity machine that sometimes gets in the way. So... I want to talk with Dr. Everett about that, but let's take a track first, and then we'll come back to it. Before we ruminate on everything that is wrong with academia. Yes. (laughs) Since we're talking about world languages, let's listen to Boom Bat Pow with My World on RTRFM 92.1. My World by Boom Bat Pow on RTRFM 92.1. And you know what we're going to boom, bap, pow right now? The entire academic edifice? Every element. Woo! My goodness me, how do I end up on a show with you guys with all this energy? I don't break it down, break lucky, it down, break it down, break it all down! We're talking to Dr. Caleb Everett from the University of Miami about his idea, rather controversial in many circles, that the languages of the world have the sounds they do because of... Geophonetics? Ambient air and altitude and other things that don't have much to do with people talking to each other. Basically the idea that the environment and the environmental conditions can, over many, many like centuries or millennia, mm-hmm. gently provide this kind of almost glacial pressure. A little massage. A little, a little push, but a constant little push so that... Perhaps if you live in really dry climates, you start using way fewer vowels so you don't expel all that beautiful, you know, tasty, nourishing, hot, moist air from your body. <laughs> yeah, I'd use too many vowels. That's it. I'm going to stick to constants. Well, I asked Dr. Everett, how has the reaction been so far? Mm. Um, n- not near as pronounced, and some of that is uh, intentional on my part. So I haven't heard, I've heard a, actually a couple, I've received a couple of nice emails. But one thing is that there were no press releases in this case, and that was actually intentional on my part because I didn't notify uh, our, our PR office or the PR office of the journal. Um, You're going rogue. Yeah, exactly. And, and But so 
you know, I don't know if it would have gotten press, but I didn't notify the press officers in this case because um, while it was, you know, it's really fun to have your name in, in different places and all that stuff, it's kind of a mixed bag, right? So you see that a lot of people are reacting to reports about the study. My hope in this case was that people would actually take the time to just read the study and see that the claims are a little bit more nuanced than they're sometimes given credit for in uh, media reports, and then that they come to their own conclusions. If they don't think it merits further investigation, you know, that's their choice. I think some seem to clearly think that it does merit for their investigation. But again, I just hope that the study is judged based on the merits of the study and not based on the merits of short summaries of the study. Do you know what? I, I don't suppose you've listened to this one, but you might want to check out an early episode with Damien Blasi. They had a study, maybe, you know, maybe you've heard about this one, where they showed that, you know, that looking over a big word lists, they found that there were certain semantic domains that seem... Uh, where words aren't entirely arbitrary. There seems to be some motivation there. And they sort of watched, as people wrote these articles, like, um, linguistic books will have to be torn up and rewritten as a key tenet of linguistics is disproved, you know. And they just were sort of watching with horror as this was going on. Yeah, and Damien was actually a, a co-author of mine on the previous study in PNAS on tone. And so, yeah, it's been unfortunate to see some of the, he's gone through this too, right, where you, if you have a, a study like that with sort of splashy findings, you're going to get the findings very much distorted, right? So in the case of that study on iconicity, I thought that was a really cool study. Hmm. And I've seen a lot of really angry responses to it, not where it was clear to me that the responses hadn't actually read what Damien wrote, Damien and colleagues wrote very carefully, in my view, and they were objecting in part to those kinds of media reports that were very sensational, right? Um, language is I iconic after all, and all these kinds of really oversimplistic things, which is not what they were saying. Uh, they had really subtle conclusions, in my view, but they got distorted. And how do we get out of this machine? We want to communicate things to the public clearly, but that just doesn't seem possible when it has to be filtered through a lot of people who are smart people, but maybe linguistically unsophisticated. Yeah, it, it is really, it's a tough thing. And it's part of the reason that with this study, I just wanted to avoid it altogether. But I can get, I've had people tell me, you know, why didn't you try to get a press release? This would generate a lot of interest um, and it would get the name of the university out there and so forth. And that's understandable. But I just thought for this time, I didn't want to do it. I will say that some reporters are, are clearly really smart and they've clearly done their background work. And I've had some of the best questions from science reporters. Hmm. Um, but then some of them understand they've got to get a 500 word uh, summary out by midnight and they just want to quote and it seems that they already have sort of filled in what they're going to say and there's no there's no room for subtlety in that uh, and so you do have to sit back and watch as things get a little bit distorted and that can be a really frustrating process and then not only do they get distorted but you see the reaction sometimes to distorted uh, distorted uh, perceptions of your, your study, and that, that's, that's a little bit frustrating. Which is not to say that everyone would agree if they actually sat down and read the study. But I think in this case, for instance, my conclusions are not that radical. I'm not concluding that climate impacts language. I'm concluding that given the strength of this association and given the evidence in laryngology, we need to more carefully consider this possibility. To me, that's what it's all about, right? That's what understanding language is all about. It's looking at these data, considering things that maybe we ruled out and saying, okay, maybe we ruled them out prematurely. We need to see what the evidence actually says, not what our intuition says. Just sounds so interesting to me because what I'm seeing is I'm partly seeing your work and I'm partly seeing how scientists are convinced or not. How a story can be initially discarded and then slowly gain traction. What I really want to do is study how we can help a story get traction. What lessons can we use from what you've learned? Yeah, I mean, that's. I wish I had the uh, the answer to that, but I I guess the story gets tried. If the you're going to have skepticism if you have a claim that is uh, perceived to be radical, even if you think that it's not really that radical. So the data has to be there on some level to even get traction. Um, I've talked to some people about this, you know, with respect to other fields, and uh, I guess there's that old adage that, you know, scientific change happens uh, 
one funeral at a time. Or what, mm. I mean, it's kind of yeah. a depressing way to look at things, but if people have a lot of their careers invested in something, and then someone comes along with a claim, there's this element, I think, of it, it almost seems like you're pointing and saying, hey, we missed this, and that doesn't go over really well. But I think maybe the key thing is patience, right? You just have to be confident that you've done your homework for the research that you have done, and then think about ways that over 10, 15, 20 years, you can get a clearer picture of what's happening. Dr. Caleb Everett from the University of Miami. So what's the answer here to getting a story noticed, but also accurate? Because we've got you know, we've got authors, we've got university PR departments, we've got journalists, and then we've got the public. And something can go wrong at any step. Mm. If it's not sexy enough, your story gets ignored. And if it's too sexy, then it gets blown up and misunderstood. Is the solution... Like, I know research is boring and unprofitable from a university director's point of view, right? Like, you just want to teach as many kids as possible so you can make a lot of money, right? So is the solution that we just need to, like, publicly fund research so that we don't need to convince anyone that it's cool and interesting? I think it's really important that people are interested in science. I mean, obviously, I, I, otherwise, uh, what, what, are we, what are we doing? Right? We are just yeah. twiddling our thumbs on the radio. But that's kind of a problem, too. That's the double-edged sword that we're talking about. Um, we need engagement, but it needs to be the good kind of engagement. I don't like... I guess what I'm trying to articulate is maybe we need to completely sever any kind of financial connection between engagement and funding research. Well, let's just say that it's not about funding. Let's just say that you would like to have people know more about your work. Okay, so how do we do that? Well, one of the things you can do is certainly help and fund science communication and people doing it correctly. We cut out of so many good journalists out there in terms of um, outlets and science journalists were one of the first group of groups of people to go. Because they just refused to talk about the Kardashians. Yeah, and of course we now know that groups like Facebook are shutting down fake news outlets and people are more and more likely to realise, oh, hang on, maybe this isn't such a good news source and starting to fund decent news sources and ones which are uh, far more um, uh, yeah, open to producing facts and supporting uh, research findings. So that's another way of doing it. And this is the other problem, and that we have lots of communities online, mm. but only some communities are very good at being skeptical and mm. listening to when someone tells them this isn't quite right. And it usually is the people who are already doing science anyway. Yeah, we've got to, oh man, we've got to build some of them bridges. Well, human nature is partly the problem. We like like to believe what we already believe. We are mm. monkeys in shoes. Yes, as Tim <sighs> Minchin put it, yes. So, I don't know what the answer is, except just to uh, keep on plugging away. Uh, patience, as Dr. Everett says. Mm. Supporting and what good research there is out there by independent outlets, such as community radio and podcasts mm -hmm. like this, which you can support, not just ours, but many others out Speaking there. Speaking of which... Radiothon Hello. plug. Hello. Next week, if you think that what RTR does is pretty groovy, and I got uh, on the down low, it kind of is, <laughs> you might want to support your favourite show, which might happen to be this one, but could be any of them, and certainly could be more than one, during Radiothon, and you'll go in the running for heaps of dope. Prizes. Hashtag share the love. Let's see if we can help to build up a culture of uh, good science communication and uh, science advocacy. Mm. Indeed. With the help of music. I have some music here. <laughs> <laughs> wow, to the, to he the came... music cave. <laughs> <laughs> He's ready prepared. Since science progresses one funeral at a time, how about this one by Anna von Hauswolf? This is Funeral for My Future Children on RTR FM 92.1. Word of the week. It's time for word of the week. You're back for word of the week. And it's going to be really terrible. Thank you, Ben. You're welcome. I'm You're just... on RTR FM 92.1, and it's time for word of the week, as you would probably already know, because I just did a dope song about it being word of the week. I'm just sitting here shaking my head. You know, we had a lot of words of the week for last week, but we didn't use them because we kind of ran out of time. And now... Mm. That's they... the problem with getting someone too interesting on the show, I know, Daniel. I know. You found Dahlia Pigram, right? And she was yes. too awesome. Yes. Find less 
awesome people. I would love to. But it's but linguistics. It's really difficult not to find <laughs> awesome stuff. I'm sorry. I've got a word that's kind of new. I noticed it a while ago. Mm-hmm. We've all heard snowflake. Yes, of course. That derisive term for people who get so offended by stuff like racism and sexism and transphobia. Which is interesting because for me it's actually, I mean, I do find snowflake quite interesting because it seems to have jumped semantically a little bit Mm -hmm. because it comes from everyone's a beautiful and unique snowflake. So it's more of a critique on the like everyone gets a trophy culture. Well, there's a term for people who get offended at snowflakes. Oh. Oh. Bro flakes. Bro flakes. Bro flakes. <laughs> the I... worst tasting cereal in the world. <laughs> <laughs> Gross. It joins in the grand tradition of bro words like bromance, bro hug, and bro down. Now, check out Oxford Dictionary's blog. They are tracking this term and all of its <laughs> bromantos. There's another word that I wanted to focus on, and this is kind of generational. Mm. I'm a member of Generation X, which was sort of like... 1965-ish to 1979-ish. What's your generations? I am a very early millennial. Okay. Uh, I'm right at the sort of beginning cusp of millennialism. Sort of 1980-ish to 1995-ish? Well, they've just recently, apparently, 1980 to 1983 is its own little micro-generation, I've seen. Let's talk about the micro-generation. What is it? I can't remember the name, can you? (laughs) Yes. It's, it's like pre-lennials or something? The term is exennials. Exennials, right? Exennials. So my wife, who is a couple of years older than me, is an exennial, which oh. basically means she's old enough to remember a time when you would take lots of photos of your friends with actual film and then cut those photos out and make collages of them. <laughs> That's what makes you an exennial, basically. Yeah, okay. I've done that. I've got still got high school journals out there filled with lovely collages. Uh, <laughs> but I have no memory of that because I took pictures of things with digital technology. So this is supposed to be a micro-generation born between 1977-ish to 1983-ish. Very tiny. They're, they're sort of like one foot in the analog realm mm. and one foot in the digital realm. They still meaningfully got impacted by the X-Files. Mm. Mm. They would watch a movie like Baby Driver and go, why doesn't he just have a Walkman? I mean, seriously, it would have been so much easier. <laughs> now, I was under the impression that this term was coined by Dan Woodman of the University of Melbourne, but that's not right. No, no. In fact, you can find an article in uh, this year's Vogue from July the 6th by Sarah Stancorb. Uh, it's called, I made up Xenial three years ago, so why is a professor in Australia getting all the credit? Now, Oof. she's not actually dissing the professor. She's just pointing out that, yeah, many people seem to be thinking that it was his uh, classification for the micro generation. So Xenial is our word of the week. Is it Xenial or Xenial? I always say Xander rather than Xander, so I think Xenial. Very Xenial, well. Yeah. If you're a Xenial or if you're a Broflake, we hope you enjoyed these words of the week. Especially if you're a Broflake Xenial. I'm, I'm oh. certain they're already throwing their Walkman or iPod or whatever it is they have left over at the wall saying, how dare you do that? I really insulted. Well, we hope you feel better soon. Oh. Let's take a track, and this one is the psychedelic porn crumpets with corn flake on RTRFM 92.1. Remember, you can get in touch with us all the regular ways. Email talkthetalk at rtrfm.com.au. Get in touch with us on the phone, 9260-9210. We have a stupendous Facebook community, which you will 100% be welcomed into if you are a super nerd, which everyone there is. Everyone is. So come on down. Or give us a tweet on twitter.com forward slash talk RTR or use the hashtag RTRFM. You're here in the closing minutes of Talk the Talk. So let's talk. Uh, Just a few emails that I got. One from Luke. Hi, Daniel, Ben, and Kylie. Thank you. I just drove from Perth to Geraldton and back with your podcast to keep me company the whole way. We get a lot of binge listeners, don't we? I traveled back in time with you through 2016 and loved every minute of it. Sorry, Daniel, particularly when you declared that Trump could never win the election. I nearly drove off the road. Yeah, I got that wrong along with a lot of other people. Sometimes I don't mind being wrong, but this wasn't one of those times. I was curious what your thoughts on the Arrival movie was. I heard you were going to it, but couldn't find your thoughts on it. Oh, um, he says, anyway, I love stretching my brain with you three plus guests. Please keep it coming. We loved Arrival, the movie. We went with a bunch of people and then we recorded ourselves talking about it afterwards. Terrible recording, but great fun. Uh, One thing we said was that the film relies heavily on the Sapir-Whorf hypothesis, the idea that language influences thought. And I kind of wonder 
wondered aloud why people love that idea so much and why it works its way into so much science fiction. And somebody at the table said something really interesting. They said, maybe it's because it allows language to be a little bit magical. And I thought that was just a super interesting observation. It brings in the science and the fiction. It melds it together, <laughs> particularly the fiction part. That discussion's on our Patreon page. You can check that out. And we're having more episodes on the Severe Wharf Hypothesis later on this year. Lachlan from Facebook says, Hi, I love your show. When I'm driving around at work with my teenage participants, they often engage with your topics, uh, especially with regard to the language of social media. You should be proud of yourselves because the kids I work with have disengaged from the education system and are often barely literate, yet they find your observations interesting. So well done. Hmm. Love to hear it. These young people have their own lingo, and I have a question for you about one term which you may be familiar with, the verb to verse, as in your team is versing my team. I versed him at chess. I will verse you next at pool. Though it's clearly derived from the Latin versus and transposed into the context of an English language verb, I can't help but wonder, does it stand up as a new verb in the light of Latin influence? Does the Latin versus lend itself to conjugating this way in any sort of grammatically correct manner? Oh, Lachlan, we, we get a lot of our words from Latin, loads and loads. And versus is one of my favorite back formations. It's a Latin preposition against, but it looks exactly like an English verb thanks to that good old s on the end. And so, you know, versus he versus her or me versus you, I'll verse you. It's a very natural thing to say. Uh, back formations are an incredibly common way of getting words. Think about the word flab. If you think of the word flab, how did we get that? Well, it started out with the word flappy. Hmm, I think I'm feeling a little flappy today. And then maybe people thought that wasn't very nice, so they changed it a little bit. They softened it to flabby. And then the word flab was backformed. Ah, delicious. It's a way we get lots of words, and it provides a lot of revealing insights into how humans perceive language. Well, we need to go, but I'd like to thank everyone for listening. Don't forget, Radiothon is starting on Friday. Our next episode is going to be our big, big three-hour Radiothon special with science and guests and gifts, and this is your chance to support the station that supports Talk the Talk. Please uh, call in when it's time. We would love to have you, and we've got some special, uh, some special things planned. Can't say too much about it now, but keep listening. Next week, 9 a.m. Perth time. Thanks for listening. Stay listening to Mark Neal, uh, who's going to be doing Out to Lunch. And uh, until next time, keep talking. This has been an RTRFM podcast. RTRFM is an independent community radio station that relies on listeners for financial support. You can subscribe online at rtrfm.com.au slash subscribe. Our theme song is by R Trees, and you can check out their music on rtrees.com and everywhere good music is sold. We're on Twitter at TalkRTR. Send us an email, talkthetalk at rtrfm.com.au. And if you'd like to get lots of extra linguistic goodies, then like us on Facebook or check out our Patreon page. You can always find out whatever we're up to by heading to talk. Talk the talk podcast.com.